So as a member of um, the house band at Stax Records, um, you played on hundreds of recordings by artists like Wilson Pickett, Otis Redding, Bill Withers, Albert King. It absolutely blows my mind. <laughs> no, it but I'm at the age now, I feel slightly removed from all of that. I remember most of it, but uh, and, and let's go all the way back to Green Onions. I really do feel removed from that because I play, I hear it a lot on the radio. Yeah. Heard a lot of commercials and so forth. And I'm going, that's me playing guitar. I was, uh, what, 20, I think Booker was 16. Yeah. So I was 20, I mean, 20. You were so yeah. young. You were so and young. And that was an accident. Was the it right? MG was an accident. They were just a house band and had the singer on Sunday. We had, were asked to come in on Sunday to record this artist. And he had he showed up at the studio with it, it had never been a Green Onion song, I don't think. <clears throat> really? No. That was just, uh, we were fooling around playing some blues, the flip side, on that Sunday because the artist never did show. We were just keeping our chops up. <clears throat> I love it. I just Stewart, love how it Jim was Stewart, just like The owner and the engineer at that time was ready to record, so he just pushed the record button when we were jamming on some blues. Called us back up to, to listen to it, and we were surprised he even recorded it. Yeah. And he said, yeah, I recorded I was ready to go, so I just recorded He just reached over and hit the record button. That was not Green Onions. So he said, when we went up there and listened to it, we're all laughing and carrying on. And he said, if we decided, if the record company decided to put that out, did we have anything for the B-side? And we said, no. And then I, I thought about something. I said, well, Booker, you played me a couple of riffs that might be good for vocal songs. And, he, and do you remember? And he said, not really. But he said, come down to the organ. I'll play a couple. And you tell me. And he started with Green Onions. I said, that's it. Four takes later, we had the song Green Onions. And the next day, I, because I knew Dish Shockers and all, I had him play it. I just wanted the DJ to hear it. Mm -hmm. What he did, he, he liked it, but he put it out on the air. I didn't know he did that. The phone's lit up. Here he is without a, with a track that has no title of the song and no name of the group. But everybody wanted to know, what is that record? I don't know if we're going to find out. So when I got back to the record shop, satellite, satellite record shop, she said, uh, Estelle, Jim Stewart's sister said, there's something going on. I bet you're responsible. And I held up the dub and I said, are you talking about this? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. So she called her, her brother at the bank. He was, Jim Stewart was still working at the bank and called him back and said, uh, you better get down here. Something's going on. You need to know about it. So when he heard the, what had happened that morning and people wanted to buy the record, he said, get, he called an emergency meeting. He said, get the guys back in here. And we got to come up with a title for the song and a name for the group, which we did that afternoon. Why did you call it Green Onions? Well, uh, that's that's neither here nor there. But uh, Louis Steinberg said, let's name it Onions. And we said, OK, good title. Why? He said, because that's the stankiest music I ever heard. <laughs> so I got to thinking and I said, you know, being in the business and being more commercial, I said, uh, you know, Onions is great, but it has a negative side to it. He said, what, what's negative? I said, well, it makes people cry when they cut into one. And also it gives some people indigestion. They can't eat them. But I said, what about green onions? So they said, that's a great idea. So they, we call it green onions. <laughs> <laughs> that is great. I love it. Um, so I need to ask you about Albert King. Um, obviously, <laughs> being a guitar player, what was it like working with another guitar player like that? Well, let me tell you the secret to Albert King. We took some old blues songs that he'd been doing for a long time and made them danceable. Which is your thing? The blues are made it R&B. They still rhythm and blues, I guess. And then he went back when he went live. He still would play this stuff. And you know, I think one of the greatest songs is a song written by Booker T and William Bell called "Born Under a Bad Sign." The lyrics in that is just incredible. Yeah, they are. And his playing as well, too. But uh, I think the lyrics is what makes that song so great. And Albert's a great player. And I said, Albert, how'd you get that tuning? He said, well, that's the way the guitar was at my uncle's house when I fixed it up, hanging by the back door. So yeah. the son had, I said, it's crazy. He took the, e, the big E string, which is number six, and all the way down to a C. And it just flops around and doesn't do anything. But he could get some sound out of it. If you understand that that uh, Albert was left-handed and played left-handed upside down, so the little strings were on top. 
Oh, I never knew that. So we we always push when we bend up. We push up, and he was pulling down. Oh my God! Okay. But he would go whoo, and you could hear, I hear it on the records all the time. You know what he did? He just make a sound out of that low E string. Just hit it in the bottom, click up, and go whoo whoo like that. <laughs> Which is just it's funny, isn't it? Those tiny little things which kind of create it's little bitty own... nuances that people don't that just take for granted that yeah. we as musicians and creators hear all the time. So. Okay. Was he really tall? Because they say he was tall. He was a great guy. But he but didn't he, really trust really anybody. Tall? The only two people, huh? Was he really tall? You know, like. Yes, how... he was. Yeah, he I forget he... how tall he was. He was about at least six four, six six. He was a tall guy. Oh and uh, he was only two people on the planet he trusted. That was Donald Duck Dunn, the bass player, and myself. He didn't trust anybody else because they'd always cheated him out of his money. Yeah. So I guess he came around and started, you know, re really did respect Jim Stewart because Jim made sure he got paid everything and didn't try to steal anything from him. That's Just paid cool. him. So I was there when he got his first royalty check, and he couldn't believe it. He said, this is for me. He just took it through it. He just threw it on the floor, but he laid it down. I said, that's money. You better take it to the bank and cash it. Woo. <laughs> Such a crime, isn't it, when you think, like, what a phenomenal musician. Well, you know, if I probably wouldn't trust anybody either if I let somebody cheat me out of my money all my life. And uh, here he was. I mean, we, we were lucky to get him in the first place. So uh, he was a great talent and a great singer. And, uh, you know, I had my favorite Albert King stuff. Crosscut saw was one of them. And he did, we did laundromat blues, crosscut saw. I think crosscut saw, maybe I'm a, won't you draw me across the law? Drag, drag me across the law, whatever it said. Anyway, it's still a, a kind of a chalypso up tempo kind of song. So, what was it like playing with him though? Because you, you played rhythm and. Well, uh, the only time I ever played live with Albert was when we were on the same show together, opening a club or something. Yeah. And uh, we used to open, we opened, uh, the hard rock, some of the hard rocks. And I remember he played uh, on the one we opened in Dallas. Uh, and uh, Carl Perkins was on that show. Albert King was on that show. And Albert was never happy with his amp. So I just one time unplugged my guitar and plugged it in his guitar. <laughs> and he was happy then. I said, oh, okay. He was not a happy camper. <laughs> so we never did play live together on stage. We probably should have, but we didn't. I was too busy doing other stuff. So yeah. But we were on some of the same shows in Spain and Italy and all, and we talked backstage. When are we gonna make another record? He'd say, I don't know. No, I had already left Dax. Duck was still there. Duck says, "Come on down." Yeah. So I wound up playing on some some tracks that he had cut in another studio. Okay. Way later. Didn't even. I don't even think I'm on there credited on it. It doesn't matter to me anyway. Doesn't matter. Really? Well, because because I heard you. You mentioned the Born Under a Bad Sign, um, the, the the album. I mean, it's criminal right. that 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 album when it was released, it didn't even chart, and now it's like considered the you know one of the greatest <laughs> albums of all time. Well, I don't know. You know, it's everybody can't be right all the time. And I do always remember one thing, and they, we put out Melting Pot. And the quote was, when they reviewed it, not much new here for Booker T and EMGs. The whole album was new. <laughs> Number one, it was the first album we put out with all original songs. Yeah. <laughs> Does that make sense? The first album we ever put out that wasn't all cut at stacks. <laughs> so there was a lot of things different. Not much new here. Wrong. Yeah. And the funny thing is, they also, in that interview, said, I guess Booker T and the MGs will never be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame the next year we win in. <laughs> yeah, they were wrong about that. So, um, you know, I'm not knocking anybody. It's just that, you know, sometimes you do your job and you do it, you know, everybody thinks you're doing your job, but you're not doing your job. No, sure, I get you. So this was a little, this album, Fired Up, has been different. The guys really do listen to it and they say, you know, that's a good album. I got a call today. I was getting gas early this morning. And a friend of mine called. He said, that album of yours, I finally listened to it. It's really, really good. I, I, how's it good? I don't know. We were never in the same studio. He couldn't believe it. He said, there's no way it's too tight. I said, well, okay, it's too tight. <laughs> That's yeah, funny. We were that. never in the studio together. And I told him the same thing I told you that all the vocals were done on an iPhone. He went, You're kidding me. No, I'm not kidding you. I'm telling you the truth. Oh my God. Yeah, well, it's crazy, isn't it, to think because you would think as a, a musician, you would 
have to be in the same room to have that connection that you have when you're making oh, yeah. music. Well, John and I did when we wrote the songs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But no, she was not in the studio with us. He'll be with us this next week. And uh, uh, Roger was never with us. He couldn't leave his house. Huh. So, um, so he's, uh, vaccinated, so ready to go. Um, so when you think about all the records that you've worked on and all the moments that you've had in the music business, is there... Well, I try not to, but I can't always keep them hidden. Tonight's the night, Rod Stewart. Well, I know. That's I love the idea of... Uh, they were going to throw this song photograph off of the album. I mean, not off of the album, but off the session. It, and and St uh, Richard Perry said, well, we'll get to it later. And I look at Nicky Hopkins, who's not with us anymore. Yeah. I said, Nicky, let's you and I go out and put a groove on this thing. Every time I see your face, it reminds me of the places we used to go. Wow. <laughs> have you like got a favorite? I sing along to the songs I can sing along to. Go ahead. Have you have you got a favorite moment that you throughout your career? No, no well, I remember some of those moments, but no. No. I guess uh, times that I spent with Tom Dowd, who taught me everything I know about engineering and what little bit I do know about it. He yeah. taught me how to mix and how to edit and those kind of things. So I got away with a lot. I mean, there is a rumor that you pretty much produced the Born Under a Bad Sign album anyway. Oh, that was Al Jackson produced it. I didn't have nothing to do with producing it. Really? I did play on it. Yeah, I walked in and played on it and left. And that was it. <laughs> okay, so that rumor is not true then, because that's what I heard. I heard that you pretty much engineered it. No. <laughs> Born Under a Bad Sign? Yeah. No. Albert King? No, 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 no. Somebody, I don't know who engineered it. Well, Tom Dowd and, and Jim Stewart probably did the engineering on it. I was in the studio. I couldn't engineer and play guitar at the same time. Fair enough, I guess. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so have you got any guitars with you now? Have you got I have any? no idea. You haven't got any guitars with you? Well, I can look around and find some. And the, the, the one I play all the time is in the corner over there. And other two, there's one that's been ready to go for a long time. Then my guitar tech fixed up for me. I never did retire the other one. I thought I was going to have to because I ran over it. But yeah. all I did was crush the electronics down. I didn't hurt the neck or anything. And the good news, it took me a long time to unzip the case because I thought I'd just find toothpicks in there. Oh, my God. <laughs> but as it, the way I backed out, backed the car out, it fell off, and I forgot about it. That's a long story. But anyway, I ran over it. And it is all crushed, but it still sounds great. So I just took the back off of it, hammered everything back up to surface and took it to the studio and had a backup guitar and all that. And I went to the studio with it and I had an overdub that day. And the engineer said, Steve, it still sounds good. I said, great. He said, I can't tell any difference. I said, okay. So I've been playing it all since then. So, um, I was going to retire because of that, but I didn't. So I'm glad you didn't. Uh, so are you... Did you have lessons or are you self-taught? Not really, no. A friend of mine, Charles Freeman, Charlie Freeman did. We started a band in high school. Yeah. Just the two of us, basically. And uh, we were so-called, I guess, good enough for a friend of ours to take us to meet a friend of his who happened to be a disc jockey. And he liked us. And he said, is it just the two of you? We said, yeah, right now. He said, you know, if you had a bass player or a drummer, I'd put you on one of my sock ops. Mm. And that got us thinking. So we went around the school trying to find somebody we couldn't. And we were, I guess, in late 10th grade then, and we, or 11th, late 10th grade. And we found somebody that played drums. We've been taking lessons for three months. Big deal. Here's the deal on that thing. And we found him in the ninth grade, which was a year earlier. And, you know, freshmen are just not accepted anyway. <laughs> but he said his dad was in a country band, and they rehearsed it in, in his den all the time. So perfect. We went over there and rehearsed. He had his drums all set up and, and we had a big time. And so we all traded around everybody at the, the school we went to, not everybody, but everybody that was interested wanted to learn how to play guitar. And, uh, I remember when, uh, Packy actually, the first time he come running up to me one day, I was getting something out of my locker and he said, I hear you got a great band. I said, well, thank you very much. I just thought he was being a fan. And he said, I want to be in your band. I said, you do? I said, we're not looking for anybody. What do you play? And he said, saxophone. I said, wow, okay. We're not looking for horns. I said, uh, when he told me his uncle owned a recording studio, which his uncle really didn't own a recording studio, he had some recording equipment in his garage. <laughs> in 
<laughs> I found that out later. But he was he had the love for it, and that's when satellite he he had satellite records, had registered debt and all everything. And uh the first studio at Stax, when you think about Stax was in Brunswick, Tennessee. And and uh, Chips Bowman had teamed up with uh with uh Jim Stewart. And so Chips was the A and R producer and an engineer at the time mm -hmm. and uh chips left and i was just there next in line basically and took over some of the responsibilities and he started chips left and he taught me a lot about playing sessions and all and the first session i played he was engineering and producing the first session i did at stacks and so i got called to play on some other sessions so i went to chips i said what do i need to do he said just play what you feel if they don't like it they'll tell you what they want Somehow they liked it, so I kept going with it. And if it worked, keep doing it. <laughs> it, it In other words, I, the theory was if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah, that's true. So that's I never, true. Re never really learned how to play guitar. I didn't. I'm still learning. But, I, you know, I don't have the desire I had when I was a teenager to play. But you must have. So you never had any lessons. You just picked up your uncle. Well, let me tell you about that. I didn't, but I told you Charlie Freeman did. Yeah. So when his mother would pick him up to take him to his guitar lesson, I would run home and get my guitar. Be sitting on his front steps when he got home. So I would, he would teach me what he learned that day, and I would play behind him so he could rehearse what he learned that day. And that's how we got along. And then we started doing some other songs and started oh. doing some live stuff and, and all. That's how we got to start that's an unbelievable story. Yeah, and that band, uh, we added, uh, you know, drummer and bass and horns and all that turned out to be the Marquees. And in 1961, we had the number three record on Billboard. That was in 1961. In 62, we had Green Onions. <laughs> so, All happened so quick. Basically, fresh out of high school. Do you were so young and it, and it happened so quick, it seems. It did. And so my guitar playing, well, to get back to that a little bit, is sort of like I learned the same way a son of a plumber would learn. He follows his dad. He watches his dad fix pipes. He learns how to fix a pipe, but he's not a registered plumber. <laughs> but if somebody's got a leak, he can go fix it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I love that. Well, that's what I did. And then uh, I told you about the engineering part, the Tom Dowd. From yep. Atlantic Records, who was the A and R and engineer up there, taught me about everything I know or, or knew then about engineering and recording and all that sort of stuff. How to read a VU meter and how to edit tapes, and he taught me how to do all that stuff. And here we are, also like probably how to write songs. So for for your fans out there, <laughs> somebody asked me to tell a story again the other night, and it wasn't live, and I've never told it live. But uh, he said I was taking him back to his hotel. He said, pull up in that liquor store. Tom Dowd doesn't even drink. And he went in and he said, okay. And he, he ran in, ran in, came back out, had a pint of scotch. And I remember driving him off the hotel. He said, Cropper, you're coming in with me. I said, really? Okay. So he yells at the barrelman and he said, bring me a bucket of ice up to the room wherever we went. And um, he said, I like the way you write songs, but you need to start writing on the downbeat on one. And I did. And that's when I started having hit songs. Okay. They're all on the downbeat. I'm going to wait till the midnight hour. That's when my love comes tumbling down. <laughs> okay. I and think so I better not on wood. It's all, always on the downbeat. The accent's on the downbeat. That's interesting. I never, ever knew that. So did you... Nobody knows that. Did you co-write um, sitting on the sitting um, sitting on the dock of the bay? Did you yeah. co-write the reason I, the reason I co-wrote it, uh, well, Otis always had, I, would, I don't know how many songs, 14, 15, I would say. Songs uncomplete, incomplete, un unfinished. He never had a song finished. He would bring me these unfinished songs, help me finish it. So like Dock of the Bay, I wrote some of the lyrics. I wrote the bridge and, you know. And the reason for the whistling, he couldn't, I don't know what we had. But anyway, you never wrote fade outs for Otis Redding. He always had his own. He couldn't think of anything, so he started whistling. And I think on some outtakes, uh, Ronnie Capone, who engineered the song, asked me to move in. And he said, one thing for sure, Otis, you'll never be a whistler. Well, Otis showed him on that take. <laughs> the next one, he whistled real good. So I do it live all the time. And everybody says, 
Well, I was wondering who was doing the whistle. No, I know you did. And I said, no, I didn't. That was Otis. I'm just I, copying what he did. <laughs> so one time he could whistle. Um, so just one last question before you go. Um, I'd love to know, because obviously I just started on this guitar journey. Um, how, how does it make you feel when you hold the guitar? Well, it's, it's comfortable. I know that. And, uh, they say, I've been asked many times, do you ever get nervous before you do a show? No, I don't. Never have. And I said, maybe it's because I'm holding a guitar. Maybe. I don't know. But I don't get nervous if you take it away. If I take it off and set it down somewhere, I don't get nervous either. So I don't know. But I did tell somebody, I get nervous when I have to do a speech. I haven't done one in a while. And uh, the last one I did, a uh, lecture, I did one in, uh, in England not too long ago. And I did one uh, for my son's college about two years ago before the lockdown. That was 2019 I did. And uh, I wasn't nervous then. That's fine. So maybe that's over with. That was years ago when I used to do it for BMI and different people. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. No, I just, I find that when I hold the guitar, it definitely gives me this confidence. It's almost, I guess in a way, it's like something to hide behind, but it's, right. it's yeah, it's a, it's a powerful thing is the guitar. Yeah. Um, so and, I've always been a little jealous of, of keyboard players, piano players who really know music. And I went, oh, man, I need that so bad. So I I was taught by some people just enough chords to write with, and that's about it. I cannot play piano. Can't really play guitar either, but I get by with it. Oh, shut up. <laughs> you can't have everything. You can so play I have guitar, always said you keep it pretty well. A, right. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> so there's a definite difference between live playing and studio playing. I think I've always done. What do you what do you find the difference is then? Well, uh, you know, when you're live, you're trying to entertain people, and you do that on records too. But I think you simplify what you do a little bit. Yeah. You need to. If you don't, then it's it's useless. I mean, I think. But some of the records now, they just want the whole record. And they want the guy to play every note he ever played. And that's all well and good. When I was growing up, that was not the case. It is nowadays. <laughs> These guys are so good. And they, young guys, 13, 14 years old, can play rings around me. And I'm an old man. <laughs> I've been doing it forever. Yeah, and, well uh, you know, in, in the old days, a fan would come up and say, man, I love that lick you played on so-and-so. I said, well. I played on hundred songs since then. What lick are you talking about? And I, and uh, the only thing I tell them is if you got the record, I bet you I'd figure out what I did, but I don't remember what I did. <laughs> you weren't you, the too many. That's the problem. <laughs> Maybe you yeah. just go on to the next gig and try to forget about the last. You yeah. I, I hear you. I'm, I'm the same with things like that. Um, well, listen, you are an absolute legend and it was so lovely to chat to My you. Pleasure. Hear Thank some you. of your incredible stories. Glad to do it. And congratulations on the new album. Um, yeah, it's doing real good. It's amazing. <laughs>